right, have ship, we'll travel. But before we actually put this bird in the air, we probably ought to go talk to all our crew members. Specifically the new ones like Tally and Rex and stuff. Get to know them a little bit and then talk to them again in between each mission. It's always a good idea. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. This is bigger than humanity. Saren's a threat to every species in the galaxy, and I'll welcome anyone who wants to help me bring him down. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander. This won't be a problem. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school, following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were one of the first reinforcements to arrive at Elysium after the Blitz hit. <laughs> Those raiders were no match for an Alliance frigate. Of course, the only reason the colony was still standing was because of you, Commander. I can't believe you held out as long as you did. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. Actually, there's there's really a good point on both sides. One is humanity's feeling that we don't really need the other races' help, because we usually don't get it. They're not going to volunteer help. Uh, there's still kind of a begrudging resentment, I guess. Uh, I, probably between all the races, between each other, honestly, not just against humanity. We're just the new kids on the block, and we kind of come across as bullies sometimes because, well, we're we're inquisitive. We don't really settle for half measures. You know, we find something, we sink our teeth into it, and we really don't let go. Um, but on the flip side of that same coin, amongst those other races, you have individuals. You know, um, Garrus is not maybe your typical Turian, and Tally is maybe not your typical Corian kind of being off doing their own things, kind of isolated off in their fleet and stuff. Um, so th there are exceptions to that. But overall, I think we find that, uh, you know, the, the council races, like the Asari and the Turians and the established races, they kind of look down on humanity, at least for the time being, and are a little intimidated by us. I think they, uh, for the most part, will uh, let us handle our own affairs, you know. Looking for supplies? Let's see what you've got. You bet, Commander. Let's see if this guy has any licenses. Man, I'd love to get some of this uh, Spectre stuff. Can't afford it, not yet. Get a few missions under our belt, and we're, we're going to get some money. It's going to start coming in, especially once we start exploring planets. You get money for every little bit of uh, resource that you find, like rocks and stones and things that you mine while you're there, and... Uh, other things you pick up, not to mention, you know, anytime you kill enemies, a lot of times they'll drop credits and stuff, so. Need to get some of that under our belt. Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. I knew working with the Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. Have you worked with the Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. But CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. Being a Spectre does have its advantages. Exactly my point. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. c sex handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. You did the right thing. Life's too short to sit around waiting for things to happen. Yeah, you're probably right. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without c sex headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. As long as you do your job well, you're free to go about your business as you see fit. Thank you, Commander. 
All right. Somewhat of a rebel, I guess you could say. But he's not all wrong. Nice ship you've got, Shepard. What can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogans lived for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. Yeah, they tried the same with us, but we fought them off. It's not the same. Seems similar enough to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? But ask a Krogan. Would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. So long, Rex. Shepard. Rex could probably be considered the wisest among the Krogan, actually. He'd make a good leader. Commander. The Krogan. Do you have a few minutes to talk? One on one? I'm sorry, Commander. I need to get my duty squared away. I wouldn't mind talking more later, though. Dismissed, Chief. Ma'am. Okay, so I'll probably get the same from Alenko, but it's it's a good idea to talk to uh the new crew members and like I say then talk to everyone again in between big missions it may seem kind of tedious but you'll develop relationships with these people and kind of get to know them a little better and stuff let's talk to Tally real quick your ship's amazing Shepard I've never seen a drive cord like this before I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype, cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. 
Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. What made them rebel? As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. 
The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. You didn't really think they'd just let you destroy them without a fight, did you? The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. You got what you deserved. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place. But we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren. And that's why we have to stop him. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach Maturin, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I should go. See you later. <laughs> See you later. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. Where else have you served, Adams? You name a class of Alliance ship, I probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. 
Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up, unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. I wanted to talk to um, Engineer Adams specifically um, to point out how, how much detail they put into every aspect of the game, even the science, into the ships and the weapons. Like, for example, the, uh, the heat sink science is similar to the heat sink science they use on weapons and they'll even explain that and so it's 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 pretty cool that they uh they put so much thought into every little aspect of the game talk about tallying the quarians here in a second anything you need commander what's your opinion on the last mission I don't see how we could have done things any better. At least not without getting to Eden Prime sooner. And we were on the scene faster than any other Alliance ship could have been. Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? All right. He won't have much else to say until after we go to, I'll say, Pharos or Novaria, which are major, uh, I guess you say, missions and storyline. Um, Tally is a good example of the Corians in that they're they're kind of a self-sufficient race, right? Um, they're very proud of themselves, uh, but too proud to ask for help. So, uh, though they tend to be really needy in a lot of ways, basically cast adrift in their flotilla, they can't go home. They don't really have any other homes. Uh, or any other places to call home, and they've alienated themselves uh, somewhat of isolationists to the point that they really can't reach out um, for help. I don't know that they're mistrusted by everyone else necessarily. They're just, um, there's no familiarity there. And so they're, they're kind of on their own. Thus them making the geth, but skirting the law in order to do so. To, in their self-sufficiency, they made a huge mistake, and now they're paying for it. Uh, other people are paying for it also. This is why the laws against AI and stuff were made, um, specifically for this reason. And they kind of hid off in their little corner and kind of skirted those laws and, yeah, major price to pay. The Geth are obviously a key player in um, Saren's plans and stuff. And Also, uh, I'd like to point out that the quarry in making the Geth is actually a cornerstone of the, the moral of the entire Mass Effect story. Uh, at least according to my canon and my game theory. But uh, that would kind of get into spoilers to really get into that. Um, probably once we get into Mass Effect 2 and especially 3, I'll go into detail as my thoughts uh, regarding um, the Quarians and their AI, the Geth, and then what that has to do with, with the Reapers, who um, were, just, were just basically becoming aware of their presence. They, of course, will play a huge major part in the game later on. But uh, like I said, I don't want to get into all that one one step at a time. But yeah, the uh, the Quarian Geth lesson 
is a, a huge part of the uh, the lore and uh, the moral the moral to this whole story in a sense very well done man the writers are just oh genius genius writing in this game once you see the the, the whole picture but yeah you notice Tally was really really knowledgeable of her people she could describe their government their system that says a lot um, she's considered young amongst her people she's just now out on her pilgrimage right to go prove her worth okay um, to put that in perspective, if you ask your average, I don't know, say college student in America, for example, who the current vice president is, they couldn't even tell you type of thing. Now, that doesn't include everybody, obviously, but I just in general is um, there's not a lot of national pride and there's not a lot of that stuff to go around right now. And so uh, her excitement when talking about her people, everything from the government to their policies, ways of doing things, the, the trials and stuff that they suffer as a people. Um, their past and and all that good stuff. Um, she's uh, she's uh, she's pretty. Uh, I guess you say patriotic. You know, for the Koreans and stuff. Really good example that they uh, they're going to put themselves first, definitely. But uh, Tally is a little different in that she can keep her eye on the the bigger picture. I think she begrudgingly will at least admit um, the Koreans' role in the error. And not only bringing about the GEF, but in uh, the current predicament they're in now and their responsibility for that. They put themselves in that. Now here, I am not going to suffer you guys through um, scouring and searching every single planet we land on. There's essentially a, an explorable area and a lot of it involves mining for resources like various elements and metals and stuff like that and picking up crashed satellites and stuff so you can pick up some free gear, you know, like weapon mods and armor and stuff like that. But uh, there are some missions on these planets. We've unlocked a couple already just from the Citadel by reading computers, hacking into computers and talking to people and overhearing things on the, uh, the, the news service and the elevators and stuff like that. All right, so I will make sure to get to each of these planets, but I'll try to only include the story-related stuff. I'm not going to show you guys me, you know, driving for an hour to go, you know, to go discover a rock, you know, stuff like that. I'll try not to suffer you guys through all that. The Mako is fun, but there's only so much of it that I think you could watch without wanting to um, uh, chew your own face off out of boredom. So, yeah, it's a good opportunity to level up Tally, though, real quick. Uh, basically, how I run my party in, in Mass Effect, regardless of what difficulty I'm playing on, um, when it comes to hacking, like, you know, um, electronics and decryption are really important if you want gear. A lot of your gear is going to come from finding it, as opposed to going and spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of credits, especially early on, trying to buy this stuff. Money you just don't have. So a lot of this is going to come from looting. Um, the ability to even compete with a lot of the enemies re require um, adding any available upgrade to your weapon and armor just to, you know, just to keep you on your feet type of thing. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to want to break into everything. Plus, there's XP. Every time you hack something, you get a little XP for it. And leveling is really, really important especially on a fresh insanity run, especially. So um, I do want to run around and grab all that. What I do is I, I will eventually have one character that specializes in electronics that I always have with me. And then um, Tally and Garrus specialize in decryption. I believe that's how it goes. Anyway, but uh, it, it allows me to save skill points is I don't... I, I can have one character do it all, but then be, they become really weak with their powers. And I do want them to have powers available. Cade Nalenko right now is a great example of that. Um, about all he can do is hack stuff. He can't really do much else. And out of necessity, it makes it a little harder on me having to bring him along just so I can get into everything. Um, and in that regards, I think one of his skills I don't even have maxed out yet. I'm not sure which one it is, but... Uh, Anyway, eventually I will replace Caden with another um, character and then between having Garrus and, or Tally along with me and then that other character also I'll have decryption and electronics covered. As long as somebody in your party is maxed out in decryption and electronics, either or, doesn't matter. As long as you've got both covered by somebody in your party, then you can unlock anything. You don't have to have that stuff. Yeah, see, Caden needs one more spot in electronics. He can't even get into that thing there. I'll have to come back for that. Hopefully I can level up before I leave this planet right here. Um, I believe the mission here is some missing scientists, some missing researchers. This would be their little base over here. Their little uh, living area and stuff. Where is everybody? And they're all gone, so the idea is to find them. 
this will lead on to um, a bigger story as we go. This is right now we're initially touching on some things that will eventually lead not only to some um, longer storylines and some more uh, oh a lot of intrigue and espionage and stuff like that, but it will also play into Mass Effect 2. We will um, be introduced to some organizations, some groups, and some people that will play a much bigger role later. And so all this is really laying the groundwork for the whole trilogy. This is like the opening chapters According of a book. These data logs, the survey team unearthed some kind of alien technology. Guess we should head to the excavation site then. Okay, we're going to see a lot of this alien technology. Um, this is going to this. We'll, we'll, we'll come to understand this more and more as the game progresses. Like I said, Mass Effect is like the opening chapters. Mass Effect 2 is like the... Really, Caden? Okay. What do, we, what do you call this? The, the, the Lydia Factor from Skyrim? Wow. That's crazy. I, wow. This isn't... This actually isn't really normal. This doesn't happen all the time. Okay. You have to force... Them. Wow. Okay, whatever. Anyway, um... Uh, Mass Effect 2 is definitely the, like the middle chapters to the story and it really is kind of, it fills in the gap, it bridges the beginning and the end of the story and the Mass Effect 3 of course is the end of the story and this is where Bioware really showed their balls in being willing to put an end to a story. They could have milked this. Mass Effect has a huge fan base and for those fans that are fans of Mass Effect, similar to Dragon Age also, they're hardcore fans. Um, the fan base is similar to like Star Trek fans, Star Wars fans, D and D fans. You know, um, they're serious about their stuff, right? And so um, they showed a, a, a lot of tenacity, a lot of pride in their work to be to be willing to put the closing chapters to a story. True enough, they're coming out with a new Mass Effect. That is a uh, uh, one reason I'm I'm kind of uh, going through this. Hopefully by the time um, we're done with the trilogy here, we'll have a little more news in, into Mass Effect Andromeda. Get a little more insight into what to expect there. And uh, But that's that's going to be a different story. They've already said that. That they're not going to um, really feed off this. They're going to start a new thing. They're going to use the Mass Effect universe. I'm sure that part of it will be familiar. The art will be familiar. Probably the music and stuff like that. Hopefully. I hope the music is familiar. But um, the story will be a new one. It will just be set in a, in a similar universe. Hopefully the writing is um, the same. That's, uh, that's, that's paramount before anything else. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I, 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 I really respect that, is that they were uh, able to do that. Because you, you know game developers, once they get a successful title, a Call of Duty Halo. I mean, you can just go down the list of all the game developers that do this. They, they will milk something until it's dead. And then they, they refuse to accept that it's dead and stinking. And so they just keep rehashing it until just nobody will buy it anymore type of thing. And sadly enough, a lot of fans of a particular um, IP or a particular uh, you know game series or something will buy it just because of the name and just for that, even if it's bad. And you know they may get on online and complain about it, but when the next version of it comes out, they'll buy that too. You know, and that's how they make their living. But uh, even the fans of certain franchises will have to admit that there there, there are times um, at some at some point uh, where that game has pretty much outlived itself. You know. That turned them into mindless fanatics. Whatever they found, it's long gone now. But in the case of Mass Effect, I thought that was really cool that they were willing to, uh, to put it in the story. Anyway, um, this, when you talk about alien technology, okay, one of the, uh, I, I, I can say this, this is really without spoiling anything. One of the Reapers, um, their MO, all right, how, how they work, um, without getting too much into who they are and what they are. Let's just say that their their method of operation is to essentially um, uh, not just put an end to all galactic life. We already heard them say that at the council meeting. But um, one of the ways in which they do it is they will indoctrinate or they will enslave members amongst races or species that they are reaping, right? And those um, those people, essentially like traders or agents, will work for them. But they go above and beyond just planting a few spies. They get they get um, they'll get um, individuals, and then they'll eventually get groups. Then they will eventually get hordes of a um, of a host species on a planet um, to basically turn on themselves and do their work for them, to gather in the rest until they've essentially reaped that entire civilization. All right. Um, a good example of the human 
agents for the Reapers would be these husks, right? This is essentially what humans become. And we will find that the Turians and uh, the Krogans and on down the line that each of the um, various races will have their own um, version of, a, of an indoctrinated or an enslaved um, Reaper agent, right? That's essentially what they mean by that. Okay, so this this technology left behind, it, it may be similar to Prothean technology, but considering the Protheans were the last or the or the um, most advanced civilization to be harvested by the Reapers at the end of the last cycle, um, this would be perhaps technology left behind by the Protheans who were indoctrinated, who were converted, that were using this technology to convert more of their own. And it doesn't just work on Protheans, it works on essentially everybody. When you send this down there, it turns, um, it turns the, uh, whoever it's affecting essentially into zombies, right? Very much like zombies when it comes to the Huss, when it comes to the human, um, indoctrinated. They, uh, well, you can see right here, they essentially just become waves of zergs that just kind of, the idea is to just, uh, swarm you with numbers. Mass Effect 2, we'll get uh, much, much more off into um, the effect this indoctrination has on, on other species. And then Mass Effect 3, they really go full bore with it. And they really, you know, kind of kind of bring everything to a head, so to speak. If it seems like they're taking a lot more damage than what you'd expect just from some, you know, mindless mobs. Um, well, insanity, of course, plays a part in that. But uh, they have resistances and some immunities and some shielding and things that uh, they might not otherwise have, at least not to that extent on lower difficulties. The uh, the, di the difficulty scaling is, it's, it's, it's dramatic. It really is for insanity. And like I say, especially at lower difficulties, if we were coming through here with level 40 plus gear, you know, all the upgraded stuff where you get several different effects out of your weapon mods and your armor mods and stuff. Where you've got ten times the amount of protection, you're doing ten times the amount of damage. You're slicing through all the enemy defenses with all kinds of uh, fancy stuff like cryo and um, poison and what have you. Now, this would be obviously a lot easier. And even though the enemies scale with you on insanity, they get harder as, as, as you get uh, stronger. Um, and then the um, the bosses or the or the tougher enemies, the more elite enemies, they get even harder on top of that. They become more aggressive with their powers that they're able to use. Uh, their defenses go up a lot. They do a lot more damage. Yada yada yada. But even then, once you have a much higher level gear and you've put your skill points in the right places, um, find skills that work well with each other. It's it's actually really basic in Mass Effect. This is really good introductory game to the series. Because when you get off into Mass Effect 2 and then especially Mass Effect 3, they went they went just hog wild to Mass Effect 3. When it comes to um, powers working with other powers, you, you you start getting to which biotics work with other biotics. And in Mass Effect 3, you have it gets to the point where just about every biotic power that you have can either set up an enemy for an for what they call a um, basically like a cross-class combo in a sense. Um, they start introducing that in Mass Effect 2, but they really go way out there with it in Mass Effect 3. All right, and then you have triggers. Like, one particular power might prime an enemy for a biotic explosion, which may tear that enemy apart literally into chunks. All right, but another biotic power will trigger it. All right, and if you don't use those biotic powers together, then you miss out on a lot of bonus damage and stuff. And so when you start getting to the really high difficulties, um, you really have to, t you almost have to take advantage of that kind of stuff. It requires you to dig into the combat system and learn the ins and out, the in and outs of, of exactly which powers work with which powers, which powers will trigger other powers, um, what you can use, which are more effective against barriers, which are more effective against shields, which are more effective against armor, right? And it's, it, it's not quite as complicated maybe as it sounds, but once you once you get into all that and you start um, putting together some really effective parties and teams, there's a certain reward to that. The combat becomes really really satisfying because you start you start um, tearing tearing the uh, the stronger enemies a new backside on the hardest difficulties, and uh, that's you know it's kind of a cool feeling. 
to really start, you know, effectively kicking their ass. Enemies who otherwise would be wiping your whole party in two or three seconds, now you're uh, tearing through them in no time. And that, that's kind of a cool feeling is you, be, you feel like you're actually becoming a badass, you know? All right, so I'm going to go check out some of these other sites, see what there is to see. Go back and pick up that loot that I missed. Oh, I ran into this guy. Uh, wasn't expecting him to pop up out of the ground. I forgot there was one here. This is uh, Thresher Maw. They will be a fixture throughout the, the whole Mass Effect series. It's, uh, some of these planets have, uh, oh, geez, two or three of these guys. And they'll just pop up out of nowhere. It sucks when they pop out right under your vehicle because that's basically a one-shot kill. It just wipes your parties. And if you haven't saved since you hit the planet, you get to go explore everything all over again. Or just say, screw it, I'm tired of this shit. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> yeah, essentially, it'll show you kind of where their spawn point's at. And you don't want to be unlucky and happen to be rolling over one of their spawn points when they come up from under you. Like, as I can say, it's a one-shot kill. But uh, if you can kind of bait them into spawning out of the same spots, you'll kind of know where they're going to pop up. And then you just have to uh, avoid the poison acid they're spitting at you. Which uh, essentially is a one-shot kill also, if it hits you. I believe on Insanity it's a guaranteed one-shot. The, uh, the acid spit that they shoot at you. Pretty sure. If not real close, it's going to drain all your shields and put you in a, a, a really bad, really bad state. You can repair um, your Mako. It takes a while. you got to go set off to the side and wait for it. It's like this little meter that goes up and... I don't know. Hopefully we won't have to do that. But uh, if we do... We get to see how to fix it. It costs a bunch of Omnigel, though. So it's a, really a huge waste of Omnigel, actually. I think there's an exploit also where if, if your Mako's really badly damaged, you can go back to the Normandy. And then come back down to the surface. And it will not only save for you, but kind of refresh everything. I, something like that. I don't know. I don't... I'm not a fan of cheats and exploits. I, I don't I don't like that. Although it kind of makes sense. I guess if you're going to go back to the ship, you would essentially repair your Mako, right? I mean, it makes sense. It's, uh, actually, I think there's another way to do it, too. But, uh, yeah, anyway. I just try to not die. That's, that's usually the best solution is just just try to play well you know come on buddy there you go lots of xp for that considering some things only give you like a dozen or two xp get to get a hundred something that's 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 substantial you get a lot more xp by the way getting out on foot and and there's a way to uh to fight those guys on foot too but uh it seems a little faster with the Mako, honestly. Especially right now, I, I really don't have any gear that could do any significant damage to that guy. We would be we would be kiting this dude for probably 30 minutes, and I don't want to suffer you guys through that. You take, I, I think you take like a 60% XP uh, penalty for fighting stuff in the Mako. Yeah, I think you get like 40% of what you're supposed to get if you fight on foot, but uh, like I say, it's time saver. I think it's really cool in your exploration how you can you can zoom in on any planet and there will be um, details on that planet. Message coming in. Patching it through. Commander, we've got a situation that requires your expertise. A group of fanatical biotics have kidnapped the chairman of the Parliament Subcommittee on Transhuman Studies. They're afraid of sustained damage and is dead in space. Get in there and take them down. What are the biotics asking for? They're L2 biotics, and most of them are suffering major side effects from the implants. The subcommittee denied a request for reparations to all L2 biotics. Apparently, they'd like the chairman to reconsider. Understood, Admiral. I'll see what I can do. I appreciate you taking the time, Commander. I'm sending you the last known coordinates of the freighter. Good luck. Fifth Fleet out. Okay, well, anyone familiar with Mass Effect might come to dread hearing uh, Admiral Hackett's voice when you're going to explore because it means he's going to send you on something that's probably going to try to kill you. 
<laughs> it's some of these little side missions here. They're kind of like N7 missions, I guess. A little special side stuff for humanity, you know. Um, I mean, while we're out here, we might as well help out, you know, the cause, right? But, uh, yeah, some of them are pretty brutal. They can lead to some pretty nasty fights. Um, I like to take a minute to look around these asteroid belts. Um, everything you find, notice I, I go through and, and I at least survey each planet to try to see if I can grab something because uh, you get credits and XP and stuff. And then once you've collected a certain number of things, like they might want you to collect uh, 20 examples of a gas deposit and maybe 20 metals and 15, I don't know, um, minerals or, or whatever, right? And once you collect all those, uh, a certain amount, you fulfill a certain quota and you get bonus XP for that. And probably bonus money too, so um, it's definitely all worth doing. And it, it's free. You can just go along and do it as you go, so. And when it comes down to actually have to go down and explore a planet, that's usually the, the time-consuming part. Like I say, I'll try to cut a lot of that out, but we'll go look around some of these solar systems to see if we can't get some decent loot. All right, so this is our favor for Emerald Hackett. We're supposed to take care of these biotics, and notice it's timed. I hate timed missions. It's just, it's too much stress for me, <laughs> right? Because I don't want to fail it, you know? Okay, this is a good example of where, uh, well, having Caden Elenko hurts along the way because he really doesn't have any powers that he can really use. Well, the more points you sink into powers that don't just allow him to do more damage, but it cuts down on the cooldown time so you can use them more often. And sometimes I'd rather be able to throw or lift an enemy um, more often where maybe I'm not necessarily doing more damage to them. Um, it's, it's more of a tactical thing. As long as they're up in the air helpless, they can't shoot at you. And notice that's where they do their harm. They can take your health down really, really fast. They say insanity's pretty nasty. And I have to wait right now to, uh, for example, use another metagel, right? The cooldown on my metagel is really slow. And I think uh, the first aid ability? And that's another thing. It's kind of like um, electronics or decryption with with hacking right is your first aid ability allows uh, one character in your party to improve the overall healing and i think even the cooldown time on your uh your metagels for the entire squad one of them cuts down on the cooldown time a little bit so you can use them a little more often then of course you get metagel upgrades that you buy from the merchants which we haven't been able to afford yet hopefully uh, we'll be able to do that pretty soon oh, so i think we hit each other with the same thing at the same time um we get those, and then having more to disposal is better. You. Not just metagel, but, but grenades also. Grenades come in really, really, really handy. On Insanity, I would strongly, strongly recommend getting in a habit of using your grenades whenever you have them available, especially against mobs, especially early on when you don't have a lot of crowd control abilities at your disposal. Looks like we got one more hiding over here. I will destroy you! Son of a bitch. I will destroy you. Okay, I could really use a little backup here. Kind of running out of time. I will destroy you. I will destroy you. Yeah, he will destroy me if I'm not careful. And my followers are glitched somewhere. You go stop that, man. Like I say, grenades are priceless. We got them all, Shepard. All right, before we search around for any loot, let's go. Uh, let's go take care of the chairman before this gets ugly. See how it is? You write letters and everyone ignores you. Force is the only thing people appreciate. So how about if I kill Chairman Burns and finish this charade? Please, I was trying to help you people. Let's not do anything we're all gonna regret. Why not? What have we got to lose? Since the chairman here decided that we didn't get reparations, we've got nothing left to live for. But I've changed my mind. Seeing you all, it, it's, it's clear that you all deserve... You had your chance. Some L2s are nearly crippled from side effects of the implants, but you voted against reparations. If you die fighting, you'll get a lot of biotics killed as well. What do you mean? You've just made all L2 biotics look like terrorists. Think of what will happen to them. But people need to hear about what the government has done and what it has failed to do. People have heard. You've already accomplished that. 
You don't need to die for it. You're right. I don't want to die. Maybe something will happen this time. We surrender. Thank you, Commander. I thought I was dead when they took me. I'll see to it that the reparations discussion is reopened. I didn't know they were so desperate. Then you weren't doing your job. A Fifth Fleet cruiser will pick you and the prisoners up. All right. Um, Dr. Chakwas, if you remember talking about Caden Alenko earlier, it's another reason to, to make sure you, you talk to everybody and kind of uh, kind of fish for some information, whatever they can give you, is that she, she talks about the effects of the L2 implants on biotics, which are basically, oh, it's an implant that helps them focus their biotic abilities, right? And the crippling side effects from these implants. And of course they make improvements, but that doesn't do anything for the original what L1 and L2 biotics. If the L2 is bad, Caden Linko happens to be one. He's just lucky. He only suffers, what, just migraines, as opposed to being potentially paralyzed, intense physical pain all the time, and so on. So this shit would drive you crazy if you were in pain all the time, you know, that type of stuff. But uh, they're suffering at the hands of these scientists, right? Kind of kind of leans a little towards the moral, uh, to the fallout story. Well, Fallout 4 especially. But um, the hands of these scientists, they, they're, they, they're suffering, and as long as the scientists are making their improvements and selling off their biotic their new biotic improvements and equipment and stuff and whatever and as long as their research is going well then these people are just well they're just um casualties and all that right and they, they got sick of it understandable but uh get some background into what they're suffering and why they finally just had enough uh this was probably long overdue actually right here and so i definitely side with the biotics on this is is he was right you know you write letters and, and go through the legal channels nothing happens they only respect force you have to get their attention. He's right. Else we wouldn't be here had they not done this. And uh, so anyway, a little background to that. It also puts a uh, cast the uh, the corporate scientific community in a certain light. Shows you what the uh, the galactic scientists uh, just what they're really about and uh, how uh, morals and humanity is lost. In the process while they make all their scientific advancements and stuff at what cost you know and is it really worth it uh, no it's actually not doesn't seem to be anyway message coming in patching it through thank you for dealing with the hostage situation commander chairman burns was quite impressed by the way you resolved the situation peacefully your assistance above and beyond the formal duties has been noted commander Fifth All right, I think we should go ahead and head to the system that um, where we can find Liara to Sony. She's going to fill out our party, and we got lots of places that we can explore here, and we even have some quests that are unlocked in some of them. Other ones not. We're going to have to come back to them later anyway. I'll try to do as little backtracking as as possible. But uh, I think she's in the Naso system, so we'll start down here, and we'll just kind of go through all these and. Uh, that's, uh, that's where we get started in the next one, all right? Been a good run. Appreciate y'all hanging out. Actually had a bit of fun. Learned a little bit, especially about the Corians, right? And about our Normandy, the ship and other stuff. Anyway, all right, if you want to subscribe, click that button up top. And if you want to catch the rest of this Let's Play up to this point, you can click that image in the middle. It should send you straight to the playlist. Appreciate y'all hanging out. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.